The imposter phenomenon was developed by Dr. Pauline Rose Clance and Dr. Susan Imes in 1974. These two women began their study of their clients and students who were high-achieving people who doubted their abilities and competencies. Imposters believe they are intellectual frauds who have become successful because they were in the right place at the right time, knew someone who knew someone else, or are simply hard workers. Having IP does not mean a person has a pathological disease that is inherently self-damaging or self-destructive. It interferes with their ability to accept their own strengths and to enjoy success. These individuals are tired of having so many doubts and worries that they want to gain a realistic view of their talents and achievements. So therefore, they will limit their goals and stay in a position that are below their true capabilities. They're constantly worried that they may not be able to live up of others' expectations of them. The question, how good am I really, is generally in the back of their minds. When faced with the need to perform, they experience doubt, worry, anxiety, and fear. They are so afraid they won't be able to do well that they procrastinate and sometimes feel they are unable to move at all towards completing the task. In other cases, they overwork and overprepare and begin much sooner than needed on a project, thus robbing themselves of time and effort that could be better spent. Those who have procrastinated finally begin working with a sense of panic, trying to frantically get the work accomplished on time. When the project is completed and they receive acknowledgments about its success, they are temporarily relieved and happy. But the next time a similar situation arises, the whole vicious, vicious cycle is repeated and the success of the previous project is negated. IP victims soon develop the superstitious belief that they must endure all of the torment again in order to succeed, thus making the imposter cycle a very difficult one to break. The imposter cycle is made up of five elements. The first element being the need to be special and to be the very best. Often sufferers of IP have been the top performer or at least among the very best in their childhood and or adolescence years. When they reach college or obtain an important position, they soon realize they are only one among many exceptional people. They have great difficulty accepting the reality that they cannot remain number one forever. The second element is superwoman, superman aspects. Due to their need to be the best, imposters are very perfectionistic in almost every aspect of their performances. They expect to do everything flawlessly and with ease. The third element is fear of failure. These people experience terror when they think of failing at some goal they have set for themselves. They experience extreme anxiety when they think they've made a mistake, and they take drastic measures not to err or to appear foolish in front of others. The fourth element is denial of confidence and discounting praise. IP sufferers are ingenious in their ability to deny or disclaim the objective evidence that they are indeed intelligent and or successful. They refuse to accept and internalize any obvious proof that they are competent and they clearly develop ways to discount such proof. The fifth and last element is fear of guilt about success. Some people with IP feelings have a real fear of success. Women are especially likely to have this symptom. For many women, there is a concern that the high level of success may interfere in their relationships with men and that they will be seen as threatening or unfeminine. Men share this fear of success because they have received messages early on to not be more successful than their fathers. People who perceive their success as atypical of their family, race, sex, or region in which they live may experience guilt about their success. Concerns about separation and rejection play a large role in their utilizing imposter feelings so they can say, I'm not really different, I'm not really more successful than anyone else. Thus, their imposter feelings provide them with a way to remain humble. Fifty college students enrolled in an introductory psychology class at Yale University participated in the study received fraudulent study in exchange for course credit. The study included 26 males and 24 females ranging in age from 17 to 21 years old. The pattern of results in the study is that individuals with perceptions of fraudulence are highly critical of themselves and because this self-criticism are anxious about the prospect of others evaluating their work and feel a strong pressure to achieve and to excel. Their own self-critical thoughts may contribute to their fear that others are concerned with and will ultimately detect the flaws they perceive in themselves.
in that when you're a student, especially when you don't necessarily have 15 or 20 years of experience in the field and therefore you haven't done 15 to 20 years of reading and research in the field, you have to pretend that you know what you're talking about. And that can cause a lot of anxiety. I study Canadian literature, and it's a discipline that I kind of fell into accidentally a couple years ago when I took a course to basically um, stick in my schedule because it worked better for me, and it happened to be Canadian literature. Fell in love with the discipline, took all the Canadian literature courses in the department, took um, exchange courses in Canadian literature, and am absolutely in love with it. I've taught Canadian literature twice now, and I'm trying to immerse myself in it as much as possible. Unfortunately, as with any national literature, or as with any field or discipline, it's very, very broad. If you're a historian, you're not going to study all of history. You might focus on um, Roman history or um, modern British history or whatever. And when you're a student, you have to go through a long process of learning about it, not just the events or the key pieces of literature or uh, texts, but also what critics are saying about it, what other researchers are doing, and so you have to build a familiarity with the field. And along with building familiarity, as with learning how to ride a bike or learning how to skate, the more familiarity, ugh, the more familiarity that you build, the more confident that you become, because you have prior experience to base uh, your future experience on. Imposter syndrome, however, unfortunately, doesn't necessarily go away. There are always scholars who are more experienced, who have been working in the field for 30, 40, 50 years in some cases, and we're always striving to be that kind of person, to have that much experience. I wonder, and I'm trying to think through, if there are any ways that we can combat the imposter syndrome. And maybe a way of, of thinking about it is that we're always students. Whether we finish our PhDs and go on to become professors, or if we're in our master's program, or if we're in even an undergraduate program, that we should always consider ourselves students. That's not to say that we shouldn't recognize our areas of expertise, or acknowledge that we are familiar with a field, or that we can talk about it confidently, but the idea of being a student is a really wonderful one because it doesn't breed this sort of stasis and com um, complacency that can come when people think that they've mastered a discipline. There are some academics out there who believe that they have. Um, they may not necessarily do much research anymore, they may not publish anymore, they may not go to a lot of conferences anymore. They acknowledge that the training that they received at a certain point was sufficient and that will do for the next however many years that they're teaching. I, however, would like to believe that I'm never going to know it all and it's actually a gift when I receive feedback especially from these uh, these sacred elders in my discipline as I like to think of them as regarding where I can make small changes regarding what theoretical frameworks might actually be better to use in this case. Sometimes when people point out where you lack expertise it can feel it can feel pretty devastating like you should have known it. You should have known it and you shouldn't have made this mistake and how stupid could you have been. I got a, a comment on my proposal when I I actually mentioned an author that was a little bit problematic and I was using his work to approve a point about um, race and writing in Canada and not having a lot of familiar with familiarity with this author in particular or the legacy that he sort of left or the people that he's working with or working against I didn't really consider it as deeply as I I might have if I had more experience so that was pointed out to me and it was pointed out incredibly gently that you know, I think I think what you're trying to say is, or maybe you're thinking about these issues, but you don't know quite how to frame them or how to articulate them yet. So it's really nice when you get positive and gentle feedback, and you use that feedback to say, "Wow, it's amazing that I I didn't know this, and it'll be so exciting to pursue this different avenue of research, etc." So imposter syndrome is something that I think takes a lot of mental discipline. 
to to catch and to deal with because left untreated it quickly gets out of control and I've seen it um, with with friends that they they simply they can't manage to get that that sense of inadequacy under control and so they also don't delight in their accomplishments they might present a paper at a conference and talk about how stupid they thought it was or they they publish an article and they think well you know it wasn't really that great you know it wasn't a great journal or it wasn't that innovative or whatever so imposter syndrome also not only causes distress but it also prevents you from taking pride in your accomplishments and you should at each stage of the journey a few ways to break the imposter cycle is getting past the idea of perfection set standards that are achievable through effort focus more on processes such as revision or problem solving view failure and disappointment as only temporary setbacks on the way to success keep normal anxiety and fear of failure and disapproval within perspective and use them to focus your effort to improve more. And finally, see mistakes as opportunities for growth and learning. Don't ever be afraid to ask for help. There are plenty of people on college campuses who have been through something very similar to what you're going through. See your professors, see your hall directors, talk to a counselor, go see your academic advisor. They have degrees and they are more than qualified to give you answers or provide you more direction on where to find health. And finally, Keep a journal of your achievements and reference back to it whenever you feel like you failed. Sometimes seeing how you got to that success can keep you moving forward to more success.